This video is brought to you by Audible. Hey, yeah, yeah, I was looking at the uh, Golden Ratio script. There's a lot of math in this, I'm kind of concerned about it. Maths. Uh, hold on a sec, what? Maths is short for mathematics. Right, math. It's plural. There are many forms of mathematics. Right, but there's no singular form. Hey, hey hang on, let me, let me, let me call you back. There's no singular form, of, there's no mathematic, so math implies mathematics. The singular of mathematics is arithmetic. And is there a shortened form of that? Nay. Right. Besides, when has it been maths? It's been math my whole life. Americans are just very slow to catch up. Nobody says maths here. Harvard is saying it. What? Harvard all? Harvard is? What's wrong with you? Harvard is a university. It's made up of many people, plural. Harvard is a singular university. It is a singular entity, singular. An organization is nothing but a collection of people. It's inherently plural. Would you say my car are driving down the street? No, that's ridiculous. Why not? A car is just a collection of parts. Oh, bollocks. Balls. Or is it just ball, because you guys don't know how plurals work? Might I remind you this is our language, we invented it, and we'll do it any way we bloody want. Why don't you stick that on a magnet and put it on your computer so you remember it? Why isn't it sticking? It's made of aluminum. Don't. Have you ever bought a new car and then after that seemed to see the car everywhere you looked? Or got a new pet and gave it a name that you thought was super unique and then it turns out it seems like everybody you know has a pet with that name? There is a name for that. It's called the Bader-Meinhof phenomenon or the frequency illusion and it happens because we as humans are pattern seekers. By the way, the way it got the name Bader-Meinhof is too weird not to talk about. You might hear that term and think that it was named after the researchers that discovered it, but it was actually named after a West German extremist group from the 1970s. They were actually called the Red Army Faction, but they also went by the name the Bader-Meinhof Group because those are the names of a couple of the founders of it. So what does that group have to do with this phenomenon? Well, nothing, except that in 1994 on the St. Paul Pioneer Press website, some commenter mentioned that he had heard references to this group two times in the last 24 hours and started calling it the Bader-Meinhof phenomenon, and somehow that just stuck. <laughs> the internet is weird. But anyway, the Bader-Meinhof phenomenon almost feels like something supernatural when it happens to you. It's like the, the universe is telling you something. It almost feels like, you know, you have some kind of connection to the universe, like you manifested this with your mind and the universe answered it, kind of like the secret. You know, proponents of the secret would say that if you focus on something long enough and want something bad enough, then the universe would give it to you, which is a lovely thought, but the truth is, it was there the whole time, you just didn't see it until you were looking for it. So in a way, the secret kind of works. You know, when, when you focus on something, when you think about it, you're more likely to see the opportunities that come your way. You act on those opportunities and big things start to happen. There's nothing woo-woo about it, but it's not bad advice. But what does this have to do with the golden ratio you're pounding furiously into your keyboard at all caps right now? Well, kind of everything. Because when you're looking for it, you kind of see the golden ratio everywhere in nature and art and design so much so that many people have thought that the golden ratio is divine. It's, it's the math of God. The golden ratio looks like this and it's an irrational number so it just keeps going on and on and on forever. Kind of like pi and not to be confused with pi but it's also connoted by the symbol phi or sometimes it's pronounced phi. So phi, phi, pho, thumb. This number comes from the Fibonacci sequence, which is a sequence in which you figure out the next number by adding up the two numbers before it. So you could say 0 and 1 equals 1, 1 and 1 is 2, 2 and 3 is 5, 3 and 5 is 8, uh, 5 and 8 is 13, and you got 21, 34, and it keeps going. So the ratio of each number to the previous number is phi, and that number gets more accurate as you go up. Now where it gets fun is if you represent these numbers geometrically. If you make squares with the dimensions of the numbers, say a 1 by 1 square, then stack it next to another 1 by 1 square, then extend out from those two to make a 2 square, a 1 plus 1 is 2. 1 plus 2 is 3, so then extend down to make a 3. 2 and 3 is 5, then 8, 13, 21, 34, and so on. And when you lay it out like this, the ratio of this line to this line is phi. The rectangle you get out of it is often called the golden rectangle, and the spiral that you get out of it, well that's just pretty. 
And it's this rectangle and spiral shape that have sort of elevated the golden ratio to something divinely beautiful and ideal and everything from nature to art to music. Ancient mathematicians knew about the golden ratio. Euclid of Alexandria, who lived in the 300s BC, was aware of it and included the formula in his massively influential work, the Elements. Since he was writing about it, it's safe to believe that other earlier Greeks knew of its existence too. Pythagoras probably knew about it, so did Hippocrates of Chios, but it was written down in Elements. Many believe the Greek sculpture of Phidias, who built the Parthenon in the 5th century BC, based the building's design and sculptures on the golden ratio. When you overlay the golden rectangle on top of an image in front of the Parthenon, it does seem to nicely fit. And even further back in history, there are some people that believe the Great Pyramid of Giza was designed with the golden ratio in mind. So let's fast forward a few hundred years. Here's a question for you. Place two rabbits in a field surrounded by a wall on all sides. How many pairs of rabbits can be produced from this pair in one year if every month each pair breeds a new pair that reproduces after the second month? That's the riddle that was presented to 12th century mathematician Leonardo Bogolo. His solution is what we now call the Fibonacci sequence. Fibonacci, by the way, was Bogolo's nickname. I guess Deuce Bogolo was taken. Anywho, there are some interesting things about the Fibonacci sequence. For one, it fits perfectly with the reproductive model of honeybees. A queen bee is the only one that lays eggs. If they're fertilized, they produce worker bees, which are female. If they're unfertilized, they become drones. Female bees have two parents and drones have one. You can also find the sequence in how hurricanes form, how a flower's petals are arranged, how a fern uncurls, pine cones, pineapples, artichokes, oh my. And with this pattern so frequently found in nature, it does kind of make you wonder if it has some divine properties to it. That was the belief of Italian mathematician Luca Pacioli. He was also a Franciscan friar who taught mathematics to Leonardo da Vinci. He also wrote a book that da Vinci illustrated called Da Divina Proporzione, or The Divine Proportion. It postulated that the number was related to the characteristics of God. Now, a lot of people think that this was the inspiration for da Vinci's Vitruvian Man, but uh, it was actually off a little bit. His ratio in Vitruvian Man was 0 0.608, and the Divine Proportion was 0.618. Also, he drew that 22 years before the book came out. That's the kind of hardcore debunking you came here for, isn't it? The number became golden in 1935 when German mathematician Martin Ohm called it the golden section or goldener schnitt. But we have a German psychologist to thank for elevating it to mythical status. In 1855, Adolf Zeising published a book titled A New Theory of the Proportions of the Human Body, developed from a basic morphological law, which stayed hitherto unknown and which permeates the whole of nature and art, accompanied by a complete summary of the prevailing systems. <laughs> yeah, that's the complete title. Zeising's theory is that we're kind of hardwired to find the golden ratio appealing, whether it's architecture or art or the human body. For example, if you calculate the distance between your belly button and your toes and then divide that by your entire height, according to Zeising, you get something close to the golden ratio. And of course, the closer you get to the golden ratio, the better. He also said you can get the golden ratio by dividing your face's width by your face's height. And of course, the closer you get to the golden ratio, the more beautiful you are. So, okay, yes, you can find the golden ratio used repeatedly throughout nature. Everything from honeybees to pine cones to sunflowers. So maybe it's all part of a computer code and we're living in a simulation and this was all designed by some more intelligent being. According to theoretical physicist David Bohm, reality is what we take to be true. What we take to be true is what we believe. What we believe is based on our perceptions. What we perceive depends on what we look for. What we look for depends on what we think. What we think depends on what we perceive. What we perceive determines what we believe. What we believe determines what we take to be true. What we take to be true is our reality. It's totally straightforward. What that basically means is kind of going back to the beta meinhof phenomenon that I was talking about before. The more you're looking for something, the more you're gonna see it. That doesn't necessarily make it special. For example, COVID-19 and Tiger King both came out at the exact same time. They're both things that are, you know, in the zeitgeist right now. And tigers have been found to carry COVID-19. And Joe Exotic now has COVID-19 from jail. Are these two colliding worlds proof that we're living in a simulation or that there's some kind of glitch in the matrix? Or are we just seeing a pattern because we see patterns? Recognizing patterns and making connections is what helped us to survive as a species. We learn what to indulge in and what to avoid, and then we pass that information on to other people. A 2014 paper in Frontiers in Neuroscience argued that our pattern processing ability evolved and expanded throughout our evolution because our visual cortex and our visual processing was expanding as well. And also more emotional experiences create stronger patterns in our memories because we are emotional creatures, not rational ones. So if seeing a repeating pattern is experienced as meaningful and important and spiritual to somebody, then it's gonna be perceived as divine and important in their minds. 
This is similar to the Mozart effect, which is the belief that listening to Mozart as a baby will make you smarter as you get older. It was based on a small study about spatial intelligence, but it doesn't have anything to do with Mozart. Really, any music will do. But yeah, the results were totally blown out of proportion, and next thing you know, it became pop psychology. But yeah, compared to sitting in silence, uh, your brain does find noise and music more stimulating, but it's temporary. It's not like listening to music will just make you a genius. But of course it became popular because we're always looking for shortcuts. You know, the Mozart effect was a shortcut to intelligence. Maybe we feel like the golden ratio is a shortcut to beauty. You know, we think that if we build or paint or compose subjects in accordance with the golden ratio that everybody will find it more beautiful and aesthetically appealing. Interesting psychological theories, but that doesn't take away from the fact that we do see this quite often in nature. So, what's that about? Take the Nautilus's shell. It's often held up as the ultimate example of the golden ratio in nature for obvious reasons, but in the spirit of total nitpickery, uh, it's, it's not quite the golden ratio. It's close. <laughs> it, is, it is close. The golden ratio is 1.618, the Nautilus is 1.58, so, you know, if you're doing the whole horseshoes and hand grenades thing, it might be close enough for you. But the Nautilus, as well as plants and flowers, do have an actual physical reason for doing this, and that reason is that nature's lazy. A plant wants to maximize the amount of sun exposure on its leaves for the least amount of energy possible. And the best way to do this, as evolution figured out over billions of years, is using non-repeating angles. And then a rational value like the golden ratio guarantees this by using a logarithmic spiral, or as they call it, a growth spiral. And from a physics point of view, spirals are low energy configurations. But is the golden ratio actually used in art and architecture? Not as much as you might think. For example, the Parthenon that I mentioned earlier, they did a reconstruction of it back in the 80s and found out that um, all the pieces were a little bit different. Not only did it not quite fit the golden ratio, it barely even had any straight lines in it. And there aren't really any accurate accounts that other buildings like the Pyramids of Giza or art pieces like the Mona Lisa actually use the golden ratio as an inspiration for their design. In fact, a lot of times when people put the golden ratio over certain paintings, it, it doesn't even make sense. Now, some artists have purposefully used the golden ratio in their paintings like Salvador Dali and the Sacrament of the Last Supper, but yeah, that was, that was done on purpose. Now, that doesn't mean it's worthless. The golden ratio might be a good compositional rule, like the rule of thirds, but not really anything more than that. But finally, is a face that features the golden ratio more beautiful than one that doesn't? Am I, am I voguing now? What is this? In his book, The Golden Ratio, the story of Phi, the extraordinary number of nature, art, and beauty, astrophysicist Mario Livio said, I would like to point out, however, that the human face provides us with hundreds of links to choose from. If you have the patience to juggle and manipulate the numbers in various ways, you're bound to come up with some ratios that are equal to the golden ratio. So while we may see the golden ratio in a lot of places in nature and art, that doesn't make it some kind of foundational constant to the universe and, you know, basis of reality like some people try to claim that it is. But that doesn't mean that there aren't some mathematical constants in the universe. The speed of light in a vacuum, for example, is 186,282 miles per second. Then you also have Planck's constant, which is symbolized as H. It relates the energy in one photon of electromagnetic radiation to the frequency of that radiation. We also have dimensionless constants, like the fine structure constant and the strong coupling constant. There are also the four fundamental forces of nature, gravity, the weak force, the strong force, and the electromagnetic force. And there's speculation there might be a fifth fundamental force of nature that has to do with dark energy or dark matter. And what's fascinating to think about is that if any of these numbers were just a little bit different, the universe would be a completely different place. And actually, you know, it's kind of fun to speculate what other universes might look like with different constants in a, a multiverse, you know? You know, what kind, of, what kind of worlds and intelligences and creatures would those constants produce? Maybe for them, a golden ratio isn't a rectangle or a spiral. Maybe it's a octagon or a triangle. And maybe they're sitting out there right now speculating about our universe and our golden ratio and our maths. Maybe that's why British people say it that way. They're from another universe. That explains it. But yeah, people have been writing about the golden ratio for centuries, and this video obviously just scratches the surface. But if you'd like to go deeper, I can recommend the book that I quoted earlier by Mario Livio, which you can find on Audible. It's called The Golden Ratio, The History of Phi, The World's Most Astounding Number, and in it, it breaks down the entire history of Phi from Euclid and ancient Greece to today. It deconstructs the theories around Phi's use in ancient architecture and even goes into the cults that sprang up around this number and around Pythagoras' work with it. Audible, of course, is the premier audiobook platform with thousands of titles to choose from in every genre imaginable, including Audible originals that you can't find anywhere else. 
So you can listen on any device, anytime, anywhere, at home, in the gym, on your commute, whenever you might have a commute again. And hey, if you're stuck at home, you might as well catch up on some books. Audible members can choose three titles every month, one audiobook and two Audible originals, and viewers of this channel can get a free 30-day trial if you go to audible.com slash Joe Scott or text Joe Scott to 500-500. Big thanks to Audible for supporting this video and a huge shout out to the Answer Files on Patreon that are forming an awesome community, um, helping support the channel, keeping the lights on. I really do thank you guys so much. We got some new people. Let me murder the names real quick. We've got Elazar Hakohen. Starting off with a bang. Uh, Thalys of Miletus, welcome back. Dylan J.L. Joyce, AKA Juice. Uh, Mark Stevenson, Derek Shields, Joe Zemke, Patrick Crawford, Hersto Kolev Custobal, James Osserby, Carlos Justin, this guy, not even gonna try to pronounce that. Joshua March, Jeff Miller, Nathaniel Sandman, uh, Jeff Alexander, Thomas Feathers, Jeron Zwiderjik, <laughs> Christian Francis, and Psychobilly. I did my best, guys. Thank you guys so much. If you'd like to join them, get early access to videos, exclusive live streams. I actually do two live streams a month for, for members and for Patreon supporters. You can go to patreon.com slash answerswithjoe. T-shirts available at the store, answerswithjoe.com slash shirts. Here's like the Starman Vitruvian Man thing, which is pretty cool. There's all kinds of cool, nerdy, fun stuff and uh, it makes people kind of look at it and go, hey, I get that joke. And then you're like, yeah, I'm cool. Uh, you can find them in mugs, hoodies, all kinds of stuff at answerswithjoe.com store. Go check it out. Please do like and share this video if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, I recommend maybe checking out this video because Google thinks you'll like that based on your viewing habits. There's others down here on the sidebar if you're watching on your computer and you have my face on it, I invite you to go check out. And if you like it, I do invite you to subscribe. I come back with videos every Monday. All right, thanks again for watching. You guys go out there, have an eye-opening week. Stay safe, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.